This is a presentation by Clara Maris on Romania. Our knowledge of Romania are scarce, even though this country played an important role in Eastern Europe. I am therefore pleased to present the speaker from Romania, Clara Maris, researcher at the National Council for the Study of the Securitate Archives, researcher at the Institute for the Investigations of Communist Crimes and Memory of the Romanian Exile. She will speak about the usual suspects, method employed by the Romanian Securitate in the surveillance of writers in late 1980s. Thank you for the invitation and for the warm welcoming. All of, all of our papers talk one, a, one way or another about life beyond the Iron Curtain. The communist terror that claimed thousands of victims have left deep scars in the social consciousness. Afterward, the terror has been followed by fear. The Romanian case, it isn't a particular one. Same story could be told also for Lithuania, Albania, Czech Republic, Yugoslavia, or Soviet Union. A Romanian writer said, after the Iron Curtain fell, the world became irre irremediably wrong. In order to create the new society, the main goal of the communist terror was the repression of the former elites. Such way, opposition were no longer possible. In the long term, the communist regime tried to eliminate also any behavior model, any authority or point of references. In Romania, the hand of terror was the Securitate. Established in August 1948, it was referred to in official documents as the eyes and ears of the people. In fact, the Securitate was an instrument of the regime against its own citizens. In order to prevent any criticism against the communist system, the Securitate first had to be aware of it. So, it had had to develop a network that could pay attention to everything. The institution's fame even managed to outgrow its effectiveness and capability of action. The mindset that the Securitate is everywhere, knows everything, sees everything, evolved in time, and it was supported and skillfully used by its officers themselves. One of the policies that were promoted by communists for social control was deliberately mixing up values with mediocre names, destroying the credibility of certain people while, at the same time, fabricating false important persons. The final objective was to create a state of general confusion. The fear of all and everything caused atomization of the Romanian society. The recruitment of friends of la or life partners, the continuous interferences of political issues in private lives, pushed the individuals to withdraw to their most intimate fiber. Lack of trust, perpetual fear for days and years, led to a fundamental shift in the behavior and even the appearance of the Romanians. It had become a second nature to hide emotion and thoughts, to look one over the, sho the shoulder, to lower your voice while speaking, to pay attention to footsteps or static in the phone line. The regime had managed to establish, especially in the 80s, a state of, of psychosis. The society was under a siege by an unknown but omnipresent enemy. During the last decade of his regime, Ceausescu was convinced that he had succeeded to create the new man, who needed no food, no heating, no medicine, a new man that would work and not think. 
Any form of relieving the accumulated frustration, frustration and tension was prohibited. Television broadcasts were remarkably poor and short and filled with praise for the socialist achievements, for a po political joke, for a party, or a clandestine love affair, it was possible to be under investigation. Invisible eyes followed from everywhere. During the 80s, even though people were no longer be being arrested during the night, at least not as many as during the 50s, life was as full of fear. The fear was diffuse but continuous. While in the 50s and the 60s, some were physically behind bars, in the 80s, the bars were invisible but everywhere from, for everyone. The entire life of a Romanian citizen was a succession of prisons through which they would go overseen and classified as a microbe under a researcher's lens. Nursery school, school, army, institute, or enterprise block of flats were prisons where everyone was being carefully followed in what they said and did. As a matter of fact, the construction of block of flats and their pro proliferation were encouraged by the regime, especially because they served, served its purposes. The lack of privacy allowed for better surveillance. In communism, privacy itself, it was a subversive notion and it had to be eliminated. The form of surveillance by the Securitate were, was gradual, starting from general surveillance and ending with the smallest details. The types of files prepared by the Securitate were general information surveillance, a database that includes formal political prisoners, persons who made comments against the regime, listening to foreign radio stations, priority informational surveillance, an elevated form of the previous one, paying more attention to people who could create problems, verification brief, a temporary uh, a temporary surveillance aiming to clear up a particular aspect. Individual surveillance file, the most detailed form of surveillance, without any time limitation, involving phone tapping, opening letters and postal parcels, home searches, especially while the owner was absent. The person was tracked at home, at work, at parties, wherever he went. The information in this type of files was supplemented with notes from previously recruited informers or from new agents recruited especially for this case. Sometimes friends or family members of the protestant were called to the Securitate and forced to give statements under their own signatures about the person under scrutiny. Another form of surveillance applied in Romania was the social one. Institutions, hospitals, schools were being carefully watched by the Securitate officers. During the communist period, the very idea of a writer was, was regarded with suspicion. In fact, intellectuals were, were the usual suspects. The writers in particular were considered potentially hostile and the fear that they could use the written word to spread anti-communist messages brought them a full and thorough attention. The secret archives includes three documents found, adding up to a total of 49 volumes. However, this does not include individual surveillance files, verification brief, or another of the above form of surveillance. The possibility that a notable figure would organize a protest or capture the people's admiration was sending shivers down the party activist spines. Admiration had to be channeled in one direct direction only, to the Ceausescu couple, with no exception. Strictly for writers, the Securitate had implemented a full set of surveillance measures, recruiting informers in the entourage of each suspect microphones at home, at work, intercepting letters, questioning neighbors, colleagues, street tailings. All this action would provide data that was used to decide further measures, which would range from a giving a, a positive influence and calming down the target 
to isolating and compromising each person involved in a protest action. Listening to everything that was spoken in the house or over the phone, knowing everything they wrote, Securitate used the information to spread exactly the ideas that would neutralize the action. From insidious slander to fabricating compromising documents, the effect was assured. The Securitate had professional working on this. The D service of Securitate dealt exclusively with disinformation, intoxication and rumor mongering. The existence of this service underlines the importance of its, its actions and the fact that it was maintained over time despite any reorganization within the Securitate is very relevant. Opponents could also be compromised by forcing them to participate in festive and propaganda action. The credibility of their protest was undermined by a political engagement. The officers would also use the publishing houses or the unofficial but thorough censorship to, blo to block the publication of critical work. All the above measures were carried out by intermediaries. The only face-to-face -face measure applied by the officers was the or warning, like the movie. The protestant was being called to the Securitate headquarters, interrogated about his action, having to give several statements, and finally being made to sign an undertaking that they would seize hostile actions. A report dating back in 1988 estimates around 2,500 measures to prevent hostile action taking at national level, only for one year. Every one of these 2,500 actions mean, in fact, brutal interferences in the life of people. Many Romanians lived moment of torment in the Securitate or militia offices, either they were public humiliated in official meetings or saw their life's work go to waste because they weren't trustworthy enough to receive a passport for a scientific convention. Few of these people lost their conscience by signing a compromising undertaking. Behind this sterile number, men and women, completely innocent, were abused. We must always wonder how many tragedies still lives under such simple figures. Writers' protest, increasingly frequent during the late 80s, prompted the Securitate to upgrade its method. Consequently, measures, plans in the surveillance, surveillance files were more detailed and more carefully controlled from Bucharest. Files kept the effort made to annihilate intellectual opposition, pressure at work for penalties, travel, inter travel, travel interdiction, secret searches or based on denouncement fabricated in the secret offices. Romanian writers, refusing to unite themselves in the last decade of the regime, refused, in fact, to accelerate its downfall. A strong public demand to stop the abusive and destructive measures would have been helped protest to spread and the regime would have been defeated earlier. Increasingly, an obvious brutality should have been a signal for intellectuals because, of all people, they were having the culture to understand that they were dealing with a weak regime. The long years of terror which led to a fragmentation of the Romanian society also destroyed the civic spirit. In Romania, opposition against communism manifested its, itself individually without ever managing to unite together any significant forces. Solidarity was a value that Romanians had forgotten it. Those few who could remind Romanians that together they were strong were surrounded by invisible walls. The Securitate officers in Cluj physically abused Doina Corna, even though she was a fragile elderly lady. Their colleagues in Bucharest went further and murdered Gheorghe Ursu just because he had written a diary that criticized the Ceausescu couple. The situation was so explosive at the end of 1989 
that the regime wouldn't even bother to keep the secret about the use of force to maintain its power. The guards at the gate of the famous uh, Romanian dissidents Ana Blandiana, Doina Corna, or Mircea, Mircea Dinescu were statement of the regime failure. Once upon a time, in Romania lived a writer. At the age of 28, he became the youngest university assistant. Although he was speaking four, five foreign languages and he had a PhD in philosophy, at the age of 44, he was the oldest miner in the coal mine. Arrested in 1957 for being supportive of the Hungarian Revolution from November 1956 and for writing a theater play about the theft of Romanian coal by the Soviets, he received seven years of prison and three years of, of forced labor. As a minor, he was listening in tears when a Communist Party activist was complaining about the Soviet robbery. His entire life was ruined only because he had been right. For nine years, he was a literary secretary at the theater. In 1981, he traveled abroad in the Western Europe and returned completely disappointed by the lack of interest in faith of the people beyond the Iron Curtain. After he returned, he began to write novels about what it means to be an intellectual living under a communist regime. For 12 years, he wrote over 10 books and hundreds of letters about his experience. In his last five years, he barely left his typing machine. He died of cancer in September 1989, but fully convinced that the communists will co collapse. After 32 years of surveillance, continuous surveillance, Yonda Serbu died sure that he lived as well as a man could live under those circumstances. Thank you.